Wood Song by Gary Paulson. Chapter 1. I understood almost nothing about the woods until it was nearly too late. And that is strange because my ignorance was based on knowledge. Most of my life, it seems, I've been in the forest or on the sea. Most of my time sleeping and waking has been spent outside in close contact with what we now call the environment, what my uncles used to call simply the woods. We hunted, small and large game. We hunted and killed, and though I think now that it was wrong to hunt and kill, at the time I did not think this, and I spent virtually all my time hunting and learned nothing. Perhaps the greatest paradox about understanding the woods is that so many of those who enjoy it, or seem to enjoy it, spend most of their time trying to kill parts of it. Yet, it was a hunter, a wild one, and an act of almost unbelievable violence that led me to try to understand all of it and try to learn from it without destroying it. I lived in innocence for a long time. I believed the fairy tale version of the forest until I was close to 40 years old. Gold by Disney and other, I believed that Bambi always got out of the fire. Nothing ever really got hurt. Though I hunted and killed it, was always somehow clean and removed from reality. I killed. Yet though that every story had an happy ending, until a December morning. I was running a dog team around the side of a large lake, just starting out on my trap line. It was early morning, and the ice on the lake wasn't thick enough to support the sled and the team, or I would have gone across the middle. There was a rough trail around the edge of the lake, and I was running a fresh eight-dog team, so the small loop, which added five miles, five or so miles, presented no great difficulty. It was grandly beautiful. It was a grandly beautiful winter morning. The temperature was perhaps ten below with a bright sun that shone through the ice crystals in the air so that everything seemed to sparkle. The dog teams were working evenly, the gang line up through the middle of them thrumming with the rhythm it was it has when they are working in perfect tandem. We skirted around the lake, which lay below and to the right. To the left and rising higher were willows and brush, which made something like a wall next to the trail. The dogs were still running at a lope, though we had come over seven miles, and I was full of them. My life was full of them. They were, as it happens sometimes, dancing with the winter. I could not help smiling, just smiling idiotically at the grandness of it. Part of the chant of an ancient Navajo prayer rolled through my mind. Beauty above me, beauty below me, beauty before me. That, was, that is how I felt then and frequently still feel when I'm running dogs. I was in and of beauty, and at that precise moment, a doe, a white-tailed deer, exploded out of some willows on the left side of the team, heading down the bank towards the lake. The snow alongside the trail was about two feet deep and powdery, and it followed her in a white shower that covered everything. She literally flew over the lead dog, who was a big, white, wolfy-looking male named Dollar. He was so surprised that he dropped, ducked, for part of an instant, then rose, almost like a rock skipping on the trail, and continued running. We were moving so fast, and the deer was moving so fast, that within a second or two, we were several yards past where it happened, and yet everything seemed suspended in slow motion. Above all, in the deer was the stink of fear. Even in that split part of a second, it could be smelled. It could be seen. The doe's eyes were so wide, they seemed to come out of her head. Her mouth was jacked open, and her tongue hung out to the side. Her jaw and neck were covered in spit, and she stunk of fear. Dogs smell fear at once, but I have not always been able to even when I was afraid. 
there is something coppery about it, a metallic, a metallic smell mixed with the smell of urine and feces, when something, when somebody, is afraid. No, not just afraid, but ripped with fear, and it was on the dough. The smell excited the dogs, and they began to run faster, although continuing down the trail. I turned to look back from the sled and saw why the doe was frightened. Wolves. They bounded over the trail at the doe, even as I watched. These were not the large timber wolves, but the smaller northern brush wolves, perhaps weighing 40 or 50 pounds each, about as large as most of my team. I think they're called northern coyotes, except they act as wolves. They pack and have packed social structures like timber wolves, and they hunt in packs like timber wolves, and they were hunting the doe. There were seven of them, and not one looked down the trail to see me as they jumped across the sled tracks after the deer. They were so intent on her and the smell of her that I might as well have not existed and they were gaining on her. I stood on the brakes to stop the sled and set the snow hook to hold the dogs and turned. The dogs immediately swung down off the trail towards the lake, trying to get at the wolves and deer. The snow hook came loose and we began to slide down the large bank. I jerked the hook from the snow and hooked it onto a small poplar that, and that held us. The doe, in horror now, and knowing what was coming, left the bank of the lake and bounded out onto the bad ice. Her tail was fully erect, a white flash as she tried to reach out and get speed, but the ice was too thin. Too thin for all of the weight of her in the, on the small, pointed hooves, and she went through and down in a huge spray of shattered ice and water. She was up instantly, clambering and working to get back on top of the ice next to the hole. Through sheer effort in her panic, she made it, but it slowed her too much. In those few moments of going through the ice and getting out, she lost her lead on the wolves, and they were on her. On her. In all my times in the wood, in the lustrous dance of it, or in the wondrous dance of it, I have many times seen predators fail. As a matter of fact, they usually fail. I once saw a beaver come out of a hole on the ice near his lodge in the middle of winter and stand off four wolves. He sustained one small bite on his tail and inflicted terrible damage with his teeth on the wolves, killing one and wounding the other three. I have seen rabbits outwit foxes and watched red squirrels tease martens and get away with it, but this time it was not meant to be. I had never seen wolves kill a large animal, indeed have not seen it since. It was horrible, and I was not prepared for it. I thought I had great knowledge about how everything in the woods worked. I had hunted and trapped and I had been in the army and seen and done some awful things. But I was still not mentally prepared for the killing, largely because of Disney and posed natural wildlife films and television programs. I had preconceived ideas about wolves, about what wolves should be and do. They never really spoke about the killing spoke to the blood. In films, they would go to the edge of it and then show the carcass being eaten. In books, they always seem to describe it clinically and technically. And it is neither clinical nor technical. There is horror in it. Wolves do not kill clean, if there can be such a thing. It is a slow, ripping, terrible death for the prey, and only those who have not seen it will argue for that silly business about the prey actually selecting itself. Two wolves held the doe by the nose, held her head down to the ice. 
and the other wolves took turns tearing at her rear end, pulling and jerking and tearing until they were inside of her, pulling out parts of her, and all this time she was still on her feet, still alive. I did not have a gun, or I think I would have used it. I was having some trouble with the dogs as the blood smell excited the wolf in them. They wanted to be at the kill. They were jerking and pulling on the gang line so hard I thought it would break, and I stumbled down in the deep snow along the lake bank and held them. One bit me on the hand, but I could not stop looking. It was all in silence. She was still on her feet, though. They had the guts out of her and pulled back on the ice, eating and pulling, and I wanted it to end, wanted it to be over for her. And she sank. She somehow did not die then, and still does not die in my mind. She just sinks. Over and over I can see her sinking as they pull at her, when I could not stand it no longer, when I was sick with it and hated all the wolves for the horror of it, I yelled, Leave her! And I think I cursed as well, but it did not matter. When I yelled, it was as if a film had stopped. The wolves somehow had not known I was there. They had been so intent on killing, on the smell of it, that they had not seen me or the dogs, and the sound of my voice stopped them. But it did not frighten them. The doe was down now, spread and down and steaming out the rear, and the, do and the wolves stopped dead and turned to look at me and the dogs. Just that. Look. And I knew it that it was wrong for me to have yelled, that I was interrupting something I did not understand, some ancient thing I did not know any more, that I knew what it was like to live in the Ice Age. They stopped and studied me. One of them, I think it was a male because he was larger than the others, raised his hind legs to see better over some low willows in front of me, and when he raised, standing like a man, the morning sun caught his head, and I could see that it was completely covered in blood, steaming with it. He had been inside her, and he was soaking with blood, and the snow all around the back of the doe was soaked with blood, a great red apron of blood. He stood for two, three seconds, staring at me and through me, knowing me, and I began to understand some of it then. I began to understand that they are not wrong or right, they just are. Wolves don't know they are wolves. That's a name we have put on them, something we have done. I do not know how wolves think of themselves, nor does anybody, but I did know and still know that it was wrong to think they should be the way I wanted them to be. And with that thought, with that small understanding, came the desire to learn, to know more not just about wolves, but about all things in the woods, all the animals, all the dances. And it started with blood.